Well, thanks so, thanks so much, Caroline, and so, uh, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, or indeed good morning, uh, no matter where you are in the world uh, today. And uh, good morning, indeed, to our speaker tonight, Dr. David Waldron. I think this is the furthest distance we've had um, a speaker for this series of talks for the Folklore Society. So uh, I think it's fantastic we're able to have this uh, discussion tonight after David's talk. So um, some words of introduction. Uh, Dr. David Waldron is a senior lecturer in history at Federation University Australia uh, with a research focus on folklore and community heritage. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, including Sign of the Witch, Modernity in the Pagan Revival from 2008, Shock, the Black Dog of Bungay, uh, a case study in local folklore in 2010, and related to that, Snarls in the Tea Tree, Victoria's Big Cat Folklore in 2013. Uh, David's also edited Goldfields and the Gothic, A Hidden Heritage and Folklore uh, in 2016, and this is, we were um, coming on uh, line, we had a chat about his recent book, Aradale, The Making of a Haunted Asylum from 2020. Um, he's also written a number of journal articles, um, chapters and edited volumes, and some of those journal articles have been published in Folklore, uh, the Folklore Society's journal. Um, Dave is also highly active in public engagement in relation to which I just want to highlight the award-winning historical podcast, Tales from Rat City, of which David is a key contributor. So tonight, uh, we won't just have the audio of a podcast, uh, but also some visuals as David speaks to us on uh, his talk, Ghosts of the Goldfields. And David, the virtual floor is now yours. Over to you. Thanks, Ross. So uh, talking today about uh, ghost stories from uh, colonial Victoria, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, to give a little bit of context of where I am, if you see a map of Australia, I probably should have put a little map about this. Down the southern tip on the right-hand side, you'll see the state of Victoria. And in western Victoria, um, we're talking about the Victorian goldfields, currently the uh, subject of an attempt to uh, gain world heritage recognition as a um, heritage site. So I'll start off with, in Australia, it's traditional to begin each uh, talk with an acknowledgement of country that... Uh, I'm currently on Wadarung land and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Now, I guess a nice little quote here about the context of Australian folklore. Um, a lovely quote here by uh, Professor Ian Clark about how spirits and ghost beliefs contain encoded knowledge about the cultural landscape. Even in landscapes transformed by European settlers, contemporary Aboriginal people use knowledge of the dreaming ancestors, ghosts and spirits to help them make sense of what's occurring in their environment. The syncretism of the tradition and the demarcation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australian folklore becoming blurred. I think the thing I want to particularly bring across is that unique melting pot of colonial Australia. This is a quote I really love when talking about ghosts in theory and trying to sort of establish my perspective on looking at the ghost story as a, a vehicle for coming to terms with heritage. Uh, one of my favourite films, one of my favourite directors, um, Del Toro. What is a ghost? A tragedy condemned to repeat itself time and time again? An instant of pain, perhaps? Something dead which still seems to be alive? An emotion suspended in time like a blurred photograph, like an insect that's trapped in amber? And one of the things I've been particularly trying to do in my studies of uh, ghosts in folklore is to shift the discussion away from a bit of a technolo technologized interpretation of the ghost through you know, people running around old as asylums or the EMF detectors and night vision goggles and people into a blanket denial on the other hand and rather look at them as a way in which they particularly are tied to traumatic histories. And I think uh, Owen Davies' wonderful book, um, on the social history of ghosts is very pertinent here, where he looks at the way in which in Britain, people's perception and understanding of the past changed the way in which people perceive the haunting experience. And as people's perception of the past changed, so the ghosts start moving further and further back in time So you start seeing ancient Roman ghosts and so on. We have ghosts also as a reflection of culture, that we have different eschatological arguments about the fate of the dead and the role of the afterlife and perceptions of the human soul that are different from multiple cultural perspectives. 
And the other thing, drawing back on one of my uh, heroes in folklore studies, Theo Brown, the way in which ghost stories are tied to place, particular buildings, sites, and locations, and the way that they loom large in the heritage landscape. So to give a bit of a context of colonisation in the state of Victoria and Australia, to 50,000 BC plus, extending further back now, they keep finding new fossils and things, extending um, Indigenous Australian settlement back uh, more and more millennia ago. Uh, we have, of course, the area I live in being settled by the Wadarung people and further north in uh, around Bendigo and Tasmania, the Jajarung people. The 1830s, we start to see a period of early settlement, and in particular, the squatters who were uh, wealthy people who came out and seized vast tracts of land for uh, sheep farming, and um, this gave a particular context to what's popularly known as the frontier wars in Australia between those very early uh, colonists and the Indigenous people that quite often turned quite um, um, bloody and difficult. In 1850-51, though, this um, transforms completely with the discovery of gold <clears throat> in the town of Clunes, about 20 minutes uh, north of me, followed very shortly thereafter by the discovery of gold in Ballarat. Now, initially at the time, Victoria is part of the colony of New South Wales, but with the discovery of gold, there's an immense rush of people coming to the state, uh, seeking their fortune, particularly fleeing the potato famine in Ireland, the Highland clearances in Scotland, uh, the enclosure movement and so on. Um, a lot of people coming from the uh, UK, but also large numbers of people coming from continental Europe, coming from the West Indies, coming from the Indian subcontinent, coming globally, in a sense, to Australia in the pursuit of gold. Um, even though the discovery of gold was suppressed by the government initially to try and uh, prevent people just dropping their jobs and running off in search of gold, um, within days, hundreds of people lined the Arrowy River and turned the water into thick sludge with um, alluvial panning and sluicing. In the 1860s, um, this period of alluvial mining shifts to deep lead mining and open cut mining with um, you know, digging much bigger and larger scale tunnels into the earth after gold. And then in the 1880s to 1900s, the economy in Ballarat and Bendigo shift towards heavy industry, thick manufacturing things like trains, bringing in agriculture, um, and you know, transforming the economy. It's also important to note just how multicultural early colonial Victoria was. Uh, the census from 1854, for instance, noted well over 30 ethnicities. Um, and if you look at the scale of the increase in population, um, Back in the squatter era, there was estimated the population of Victoria was roughly 20,000 people, mostly employed in uh, sheep farming. By 1854, uh, the census indicated 238,000 people, and they're the people that they have catalogued and are meant to be there. 1857, it's 400,000. By 1860, it's 500,000. And it's worth noting that these numbers are in, uh, understated. Um, through itinerant workers and also the Indigenous population weren't um, counted in these sorts of censuses until uh, 1967. So most of these are British, but there are also large numbers of Chinese, Poles, um, people from the West Indies, quite a large number of Americans, Romanians, Armenians, and uh, all sorts who are flooding. And you'll get a lot of place names here that are named after particular ethnic camps. Uh, I live, for instance, in a suburb of Ballarat called Canadian, um, hence the people who settled there. There's areas such as Yankee Flat, um, there's French Lane, you know, all these different uh, ethnic-specific sites. So to give that multicultural quote, um, you know, a, a Polish miner, for instance, uh, talked about how miners would amuse themselves with conversations about their countries of origin and its habits and describe events they've experienced because everyone crossed many lands and many a sea before arriving in Australia with a lovely little 1867 oil painting here. Now I'm gonna show you a pic. This pic is um, a cartoon from the period, but it is a racial caricature of uh, Chinese people. So just let you know, it's not particularly pleasant. 
Um, one of the big things that uh, dominated a lot of cultural perspectives was um, conflict with uh, Chinese miners who came across uh, fleeing the opium wars and floods in southern China in the uh, later 1850s. Um, this particular uh, picture in the Illustrated Police News of um, Melbourne, it's actually a depiction of a fellow by the name of Ah Kuhn, who was formerly Chinese uh, headman, but was jailed for um, um, assaulting his, his adoptive uh, six-year-old daughter. And when he was released from jail, there was a cordon of um, Chinese fellows who had these jars with Chinese characters on them, and he had to walk down this gauntlet with them all smashing the... Uh, does upon him. But it gives a bit of an idea of those sorts of depictions, which in some cases, such as the Landing Flat Riots in 1857, turn quite um, uh, violent and aggressive. And indeed, that um, anxiety and conflict regarding Asian immigration is still a major issue in politics today, as people may have seen in the papers. Another important impact at the time is the the transformation of the environment. This is a view from Black Hill, and you can see the scale to which the environment was transformed through mining in a very short period of time. I, it always staggers me to think what this would have been like for the Wadarung people to have had their landscape transformed um, from a forested hillside to this in such a short space of time. And coming with this, of course, was pollution of the drinking water, typhus outbreaks, and uh, uh, people becoming sick through poisoning from um, heavy metals used in the mining industry. So the thing to note in colonial Victoria was people brought their folklore with them. There's some interesting challenges about what things survived the transition from the country of origin, what didn't the way in which folklore is tied to the landscape and how that was transported to a new cultural context, the multicultural influences as you had synergies of people from different ethnic backgrounds together. Um, in Australia, um, there was significant hostility from government regarding uh, traditional folkloric practices as an attempt to move past what they saw as the legacy of superstition from the rural sectors of society. And also this interesting problem of how you maintain folklore when you have a disconnection from cultural context and landscape. And I've got a picture in the background of a so-called witch's mark from Glenormiston College. Um, I was fortunate enough to go out with Ian Evans uh, a few years back across Western Victoria doing a survey of these sorts of marks, which, of course, in my time in Britain, you know, old castles and churches and so on are covered in them. In Australia, they're comparatively rare, but you do find them mostly in places like stables and uh, churches and so on. Um, we get discussions of uh, stories of people keening and attempt to break up keening circles um, by police, particularly driven by anti-Irish sentiment. And there was a lot of anxiety, particularly after the Eureka Rebellion in 1854. Um, that there was kind of a fifth column by France and Ireland to undermine the new colony. So we've got some examples here, depictions. One of the anxieties people had was trying to stamp out belief in witchcraft, and it's presented very negatively, but nonetheless, it does appear in the papers. Um, uh, a case there with Anne Russell, for instance, who was assaulted by a German neighbour who wanted to bathe his hands in her blood to cure his uh, cows that he felt she had cursed after he refused to give her and her daughter butter. There's uh, an extensive trade in uh, children's calls. And we see other sorts of folklore practices. But what's sort of interesting is that they're quite prominent in the 1840s, but by the end of the 1860s, they're mostly dying out. And that the um, literacy acts of uh, the 1860s seems to have worked to stomp out a lot of this kind of traditional belief, perhaps exacerbated by the difficulties of translating to Australia. Have some other examples. I don't want to talk too much about these sorts of things. And Ian Evans and people like Brian Hoggard and so on have done wonderful work in this, but just noting that they're there. Much like these, you'll get these a lot in old stables. Um, these are some fascinating ones I found at uh, Boanga Cob and Co uh, coach lines, um, about half an hour to the west of me. I have the salt here, here on the right. Um, Glenormiston College, and you can see, you know, another little mark here at uh, Anderson's Mill, which is about 
uh, half an hour to the north. Similarly, some of these early stories, um, 1875, uh, uh, there's uh, Melbourne's All of Fire with the discovery of a hand of glory hidden in the walls of a home in uh, uh, Fitzroy in Melbourne. I have a picture of the Whitby one here. And it was believed that the uh, lady in question, Margaret Connor, had taken it from a body in a gibbet from uh, her time as a convict in Tasmania. So we get a lot of these sorts of yarns flowing through and legacies of folklore from the UK, particularly imported across. And if you want to look up here, there's a great book by uh, William Allison, uh, sorry, Benjamin Noakes, who recorded the charms and so on of cunning man William Allison in his um, uh, almanac in the uh, 1840s. You can have a look at some of these sorts of legacies um, around. So when I talk about that folkloric context, in Australia, we have an inherited and established notion of ghosts. Um, Owen Davies, for instance, talks about the way in which perceptions of ghosts went through a considerable period of flux through um, conflicts between Catholic and Protestant notions of the afterlife. However, when we start to see these ghost stories developing in Australia, that, to a large extent, has been resolved. Um, ghosts typically appear as a link to folklore and heritage, and in particular, ghost stories start to pop up tied to um, events from the 1850s and 60s, um, tied to traumatic histories, um, social injustices and conflicts. There's also a legacy of the White Australia policy enacted in 1901 with Federation, where a lot of the um, non-British folkloric legacy was quite deliberately um, suppressed, but it does come up when you start doing a search through the papers. So we start to find through the newspapers, um, when I start digging around terms like ghosts and haunting and so on, quite a wide variety of stories. The ghost among the rabbit traps um, is there talking about, uh, you know, Pike's Creek near Melton, the story of a headless woman who is seen uh, floating through the paddocks tied to a former murder, uh, which uh, young men out uh, catching rabbits um, encounter. Um, Werribee Mansion was believed to be is believed to be haunted, one of the old squatter mansions, um, <clears throat> haunted by a young uh, a young boy, a form uh, the former gatekeeper, and a lady who wears Victorian clothing. Um, this is usually tied to the story of uh, Mary, who um, died in a terrible accident in 1908 when a hair caught a light from bedside candle. Um, Stories of ghosts associated with women having their clothing and hair on fire are fairly common. In Ballarat, one of the buildings, for instance, is meant to have a corner which is uh, supposedly deathly cold because a uh, woman had her undergarments catch on fire and uh, set fire to the building and um, purportedly died there in the 1860s. This is a fascinating little ghost story. What I bring this one up for, this is the old Ballarat Bridge. and um, there's a ghost story here which has been told to me by quite a few people who told me that their parents told them this story. It's of um, that the bridge is meant to be haunted by a Scotsman on who comes out there at some nights and starts shoveling ash into bags only to mysteriously vanish at midnight. And what I found interesting was when I started digging in the papers, this is the first mention I found of it, uh, dating 1877. And it seems to have been passed down um still tell to people um, today in terms of, you know, be careful at, at the bridge, you'll see the ghost of this uh, Scotsman. Um, he'll be in bad luck as he uh, shovels ash into these bags. William Bailey, um, this is a large um, um, Italianate mansion in Ballarat. There's a, it's quite a complex story with this mansion and it's a ghost story. So one of the old squatting families, um, the Leomonts, um, used one of their employees, William Bailey, to purchase the Edgerton Gold Mine, um, uh, which is a Welsh mining town. It's, it's quite an interesting place to go to. All the graves and so on are all in uh, Welsh when you go there. And he told his employer that the mine was worthless, but he'd managed to arrange um, a, a um, an anonymous consortium to buy the mine off them. Um, he was actually given a... Uh, amount of money as a reward for having done this. And he got the nickname Weeping Bailey. The, the tears he shed at the generosity of uh, the Learmonth family for um, including him in the deal. 
What Bailey didn't reveal to the Learmonth family was that he was the anonymous consortium and the mine was actually worth millions. And Bailey became overnight a uh, millionaire. This led to one of the longest running and quite brutal court battles in Australian history, uh, multiple cases of people bringing down um, thugs and so on to intimidate witnesses and assaults. And William Bailey himself first uh, took to patrolling around the uh, grounds of his uh, manor lodge at night and through the corridors of his mansion uh, with loaded firearms, leading to an incident where a statue of St Michael he misinterpreted for um, one of the Learmonth uh, thugs, opened fire on it and uh, damaged it, which um, after this place was converted into a hospital during the First World War, doctors used quite famously as a um, ashtray. And uh, according to legend, and certainly according to the sisters who still work there today, the uh, nuns, um, they're quite convinced they see Bailey's ghosts around the premises. Um, I have the, it's actually a fascinating mansion to go to. I have the floor plan down here to the right, but it actually has like a secret room leading to his gold safe, which in his paranoia, he hid underneath the stairs. And another secret room to a theatre, a small little theatre off the side through a kitchenette um, behind a bookshelf. Now, I just bring up here the way in which, you know, in studying folklore, you're in act folklore, top left. I recently uh, did a little job for Chaosium, who make the role-playing game Call of Cthulhu, based on a live play theatrical event we made on the uh, story. And, you know, here's me continuing the legend of William Bailey's uh, haunted mansion down through, um, down through time. We also have quite a number of ghost stories regarding First Nations people. This one, the Hart and Hills ghost, relates to a story where there was a conflict between the uh, colonists and the Indigenous people at a place called uh, Blackfellows Creek. And um, there's a story here of the place being haunted and a fellow in 1876 by the name of Robert Downey took to uh, dressing as a ghost on the site, which caused considerable consternation <laughs> And the um, <clears throat> squatting settlement at Harton Hill set out some quite large posses until they eventually captured the uh, erstwhile ghost and uh, beat him up and got him to confess to being the ghost um, to settle things back down. Um, but there's actually a number of um, ghost stories, uh, such as Waterloo Creek, where there's a... Um, um, a site where women and children were um, shot by the settlers, uh, which is reputed to be haunted. And you'll find quite a lot of these in site names uh, around that part of Victoria, places like Haunted Gully, Massacre Bay and so on, relating to that difficult history. I don't want to talk too much about this because it's something um, um, Indigenous people need to tell themselves and it's not really my place, but I want to note that these stories are there and have an impact and a legacy and are still told um, to this day associated with these sites. Another one to note is, of course, the Chinese population. Um, I have two uh, uh, ghost stories in that article there, but there's quite a number that pop up. And this is sort of fascinating when you get quite a different perception of what ghosts are. Um, the two stories in the article to the left there relate to um, one particular case of uh, the claim of spirit had possessed a cat uh, with a black body and a yellow, uh, sorry, a, a white um, underbelly um, that was actually the spirit of a Chinese miner. And that the Chinese uh, gentleman um, conferred with the spirit through putting ash upon a steel tray um, and mixing it with oil. And the cat could write Chinese characters in the tray that could um, give uh, the location of this uh, fellow who'd been murdered. There's another story there as well. After a young girl died from a firecracker from a Chinese funeral rite um, set fire to her dress, um, that the ancestors kept visiting his home saying that they couldn't rest and that he needed to get the community together to build a kiln. The kiln's actually still there in the Chinese portion of the cemetery um, to conduct funeral rites to care for the dead. And it's just worth noting that um, Ballarat and Bendigo both lay claim to the... Um, oldest uh, Chinese lion and Chinese dragon in the world, um, given that many from mainland China were lost in um, the uh, Great Cultural Revolution. Um, and just noting that um, the longevity of that Chinese settlement and so on here in Australia, I actually adore this Chinese lion head here. Um, it's quite a beautiful piece of um, work. We have, again, uh, some of these myths you'll recognise from the UK. One of the more famous strand ghost stories is the Headless Horseman of Black Swamp. 
And there's a story here of a drover who was killed by bush rangers and decapitated. And sometimes late at night, um, he will ride through and scare people's cattle, um, seeing a headless figure. And they've actually commemorated this with the monument and the uh, uh, signage on the site where um, the headless horseman is meant to roam. I'm sure people in the UK are very familiar to this, but one of the most common ghost stories are found in Australia is that of the woman in white, or um, as I've heard summed up by uh, students, uh, the sad Victorian lady in the window. The myth for most of these, and I find most towns have a version of them. We have the picture from the Bridge Hotel on the left. We have the Union Bank building in Ballarat where I live, is the story of a young woman who becomes pregnant out of wedlock and is abandoned by her suitor and so is disgraced by her community and takes her own life, and then she's seen in the window of a building um, late at night. Um, in both cases, uh, you know, it's an interesting story that draws attention to the vulnerability of women. Um, Chuka to the left, for instance, has quite a lot of ghost stories that sort of come out of that um, uh, difficult history and the uh, history of smuggling from the riverboats uh, coming in on the Murray there and had an, a number of those women in white um, stories of uh, people abandoned or abused or assaulted who um, um, passed on and that legacy is kept alive in those um, stories. Elizabeth Scott is perhaps one of the most famous of these in Victoria. Um, look, the story itself is very grim. I just bit of a, you can see with the writing here, a um, little bit of the trigger warning of the context, but uh, she was an Irish indentured servant who at 13 was sold to a tavern owner by her mother who had a very unsavoury reputation. And the situation was on one night um, she was being assaulted by um, her husband and um, an Indigenous fellow and a Chinese uh, worker at the tavern um, intervened and the fellow produced a firearm which led to a scuffle and the um, Robert Scott was uh, shot. Um, they went to a very conservative judge with a very strong anti-Irish sent uh, sentiment and all three of them were hung and she was the first woman hung at Old Melbourne Jail. And even in the papers at the time, they saw this as quite an injustice because Elizabeth actually fled um, the scene as soon as the scuffle occurred and wasn't even in the room at the time the shooting occurred. Yet nonetheless, all three were murdered. And so um, Old Melbourne Jail is reputed to be haunted by the um, Elizabeth's ghost. I've seen her death mask there, which is quite tragic. She was such a small, slight um, person um, who was, again, all three of them hung and arguably and certainly in popular sentiment at the time, very unjustly, um, ex one of the 86 people executed in um, this jail. Um, this little story here I quite enjoyed uh, on a bit of a turn from that very dark Previous story, Headless Women in White. This is from a, another gold mining town of Castlemaine. And this pertains to uh, a story. And I was able to find the, um, the 937 records in the public records office discussing this event um, where a boundary rider came into the Criterion Hotel talking about an encounter with a headless woman in white. And he kept going on about she had a fine body, a fine body. And when he touched her, it was like her flesh was made of bones. And uh, upon investigation of the site, police found um, a, a large quantity of homemade spirits and an abandoned draper's dummy. So I think it would have been quite an interesting thing to watch. <laughs> and, you know, there's quite a few of these. And one of the things you get in terms of trying to sort of settle down these ghost stories are these sort of sceptical comical narratives, similar ones, stories of a, a headless wailing dog that turned out to be a cat with its head in a tuna tin, that sort of thing become quite common. In this case, though, there is actually a story that was based on it, even though, of course, Victorian newspapers are, um, you know, famously dubious for this sort of folklore. Arguably Australia's most famous ghost story, Fisher's Ghost, uh, pertaining to the story of uh, Frederick Fisher, and it relates to a ghost that was seen continually on the site of this fellow's murder, which led to an investigation finding the body. However, no such police records occur, and it's believed that the story came out of a poem, The Sprite of the Creek. Um, nonetheless, uh, there's now a festival of Fisher's Ghost that's been held there since uh, 1956, and the opera Fisher's Ghost, which has led to it being 
absolutely um, indelibly entrenched into the folkloric landscape. Another um, particular source, this is the Ararat Mental Hospital. I've recently uh, written a book on this as, um, as uh, discussed earlier. Um, it's now become regarded as Australia's most haunted site as far as the press is concerned and Australia's um, most popular dark tourist destination. It takes approximately 30,000 uh, visitors through each year, um, particularly in the uh, ghost tours and investigation tours and all that kind of thing. It's quite an enormous um, asylum complex of uh, 60 uh, buildings built in the um, um, Italian um, Italianate style. And one of the things that this is interesting here is even when the uh, site was still running, which it was until 1992, um, people talked about the location being haunted. And where I found this particularly interesting is the synergy that comes in the ghost stories of this site between a traumatic history the issue of um, both fear of the mentally ill and fear of becoming ostracised and alienated through being designated uh, with a mental illness, combined with a thick layer of um, popular culture. I'm bringing up these two images here, for instance, to talk about that uh, traumatic legacy. Um, something only ever practised in the colony of Victoria um, was the practice of stacking, which is putting people stitched up into a sack around their neck, which was described as quite a horrific experience. Um, the story of the sacking of a wife of Cape Shank was where um, a fellow was attempting to um, divorce his wife. He arranged with a uh, police officer who was a friend of his to declare her insane and have a sent in a sack via a cart um, for two days ride through the hot weather to the Yarrabend Asylum in the hope that she would be so delirious that she would be, um, the Declaration of Sanity would be accepted and she would be um, put away so that he could marry a younger woman. Unfortunately, she was able to convince the uh, doctors at the time of what had occurred, um, but it drew attention to the way in which um, quite a large number of women had been put into asylums for this purpose. Indeed, in the 1883 uh, Zox reporting to um, asylums in Victoria. He talked about quite a large number of these women and he speculated in the report, if I can get the quote right, uh, these women um, are put to work uh, cleaning the hospital, running the farm, running the winery, cleaning the bedpans and engage in all sorts of labour under fear of being put into uh, seclusion and confinement. And he said, if they're able to do all this work unsupervised, um, why do they need to be in asylum? And he said that in practice, asylums were far less likely to let these women go than people with serious mental conditions because they performed all this labour extensively for free over fear of punishment. But it draws attention to the um, issues of um, the use of incarceration and so on in mental hospitals, which, um, and of course, the large quantities of people put into these um, enormous asylums in colonial Victoria, leading to Jill Geese's uh, recent award-winning book, uh, The Maddest Place on Earth, looking at the vast um, expansion of um, asylums in um, colonial uh, Victoria. This is another, of course, very famous uh, haunted site, uh, uh, Port Arthur, which again draws attention to the, this is in Tasmania, but it does draw attention to convicts associated with, sorry, um, ghosts associated with the um, experience of convicts who are often quite uh, brutally treated in um, Australian history, being put to work as forced labour, um, the model prison system where prisoners were denied their identity, kept hooded and um, unable to talk and communicate with each other and leading to significant trauma. And of course, um, the brutal treatment of flogging and so on that was um, uh, given to convicts here. So this popularity of ghosts, and it was indeed seen as quite with some considerable alarm in the conservative press in Australia, um, you know, led to some anxiety, anxiety about how do we stomp out this kind of superstitious belief? And I love this quote from the Argus, um, it's a noticeable symptom of the reactionary movement against the materialistic philosophy so much in vogue at the present that ghosts, after having been objects of contempt to the educated and intelligent classes for some generations, are beginning to grow again into flavour. 
But outside the obscure regions tenanted by this creed, there are distinct signs that ghosts, which we thought were laughed out of existence by the robust common sense of the 18th century, are creeping back into the world, revisiting again in the glimpses of the moon in these rather thickly times of the moribund 19th century. And indeed, the proliferation of ghost beliefs and, of course, people hoaxing ghosts, which we'll look at shortly, um, was called in the papers the ghost nuisance. And there's a lot of discussion about how to grapple with this ghost nuisance problem. Um, the Anglican bishop to Ballarat, for instance, um, in 1875, lamented that he'd been called upon to perform more exorcisms in his three years in Ballarat than he had in the previous decade in Jamaica. And he was quite disappointed because he expected Jamaica to be superstitious and want such papal practices as exorcisms. Um, and he was very disappointed that he was encountering this upon British subjects in the colony of Victoria. Um, Sir Archibald Mitchie, the Attorney General, actually went and did um, speaking engagements in mechanics institutes across um, Victoria. And he proposed a different angle to take where he argued that they were important in a folkloric sense that they enchant the world, they draw attention to difficult histories, but they have an important cultural legacy. So attempting to suppress them will be unsuccessful. Rather, what we need to do is put them in their proper context as a folkloric study. And again, I do love his language here um, in his uh, guest lecture here at the Mechanics Institute. Is there anyone in this company who has entirely outgrown his belief in ghosts? If so, has he not lost something which left behind it some regret? He may be wiser, he may have read his physiology, he may have studied insanity and the various forms of delusion springing from the morbid action of the brain, but he has lost forever the supernatural shudder, the terrifically delicious creeping of the hair and of the heart coming into the mouth, attendant on his listening to or reading of for the first time, a good, authentic, and by justices of the peace attested ghost story. Now, adding into the complexity of this is the popularity of spiritualism in Victoria. And indeed, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself talked about Ballarat, Bendigo and Castlemaine as meccas for spiritualism. And you have characters such as William Henry Terry, for instance, being quite prominent in the movement here, uh, producing, you know, in, sorry, uh, yeah, producing its own uh, newspaper, The Harbinger of Light, and um, in, uh, having an international spiritualist such as uh, Dr. Henry Slade travelling to Australia and performing shows, Dr. Jesse Shepherd, who performed at Her Majesty's Theatre here, um, you know, engaged in um, these, these elaborate performances. It's kind of fascinating. I do a, a theatrical performance with a colleague of mine, Dr. Joe Klein, a fellow historian who was also a magician. And when we read through these depictions, she finds it quite fascinating that what in a sense a lot of these shows are is people are sitting down watching a magic show and indeed she's able to replicate most of the effects used herself. But a magic show nonetheless that purports to give people connection to the realm of the spirits and to their past relatives. You talk about with Henry Slade, for instance, a very clever incident where he was doing the uh, spirit slates effect and a uh, prominent Ballarat, Ballarat spiritualist um, uh, James Curtis had come along and naively brought his own spirit slates. And, of course, the magical effect doesn't work if you use your own spirit slates rather than the specially made ones. And uh, James Curtis put them on the table and he said the table rocked violently and the spirit slates fell to the ground, the slates fell to the ground and broke. And the then, uh, Dr. Henry Slade was able to produce his own slate saying, don't worry, I've got some backups, which... Uh, um, Joe was uh, identifying as a very clever, quick thinking way of uh, making sure he could still produce the effect with the magical slates. James Curtis is a fascinating figure. He was quite an ardent um, advocate and uh, corresponded a lot with Conan Doyle um, about spiritualism. And he had a story not um, atypical where he came to Australia to make his fortune in the gold rush, but left behind his fiancée, his beloved Annie Beale. And after he arrived, he start, started receiving letters from Annie Beale about her slow deterioration from tuberculosis. And he grappled with this through um, mediums and so on. He called his book he wrote, which is a fascinating, really detailed um, discussion of his experiences in the spiritualist movement in the 19th century in Australia, 
uh, Rustlings of a Golden City. And a student of mine did a PhD on James Curtis, and he talked about that it's actually, he called it a love story with the woman he never got to marry. Um, the rustlings referred to the, her skirts. He believed sometimes he could smell her perfume at the later in late at night. And he had this relationship with Annie Beale through um, the work of these mediums. And the mediums themselves were also corresponding with each other about what they knew about Annie Beale and engaging with James Curtis um, in this practice. Nonetheless, James Curtis, um, in his um, epilogue to his book, talks about that if he could exchange all the wealth that he created during the gold rush for his experiences with the mediums and spiritualists um, coming to terms with the loss of his Annie Beale, he would no doubt choose the latter. So we have some extracts from The Harbinger of Light, the um, uh, monthly journal of the um, spiritualist societies uh, in Victoria. Um, and we have a lot of these um, yeah, interesting discussions and engagements, of course, with ghosts and, of course, people going to places that are believed to be haunted and encountering and working with um, spirits. Now, also going on at the time, though, were attempts to disprove uh, these stories. Uh, this is another depiction from uh, Egan Lee's uh, Illustrated Police News. One fellow, for instance, um, <clears throat> Professor S.S. Baldwin, for instance, travelled around Victoria following spiritualists, offering £500 if he couldn't replicate an effect someone had seen performed by a spiritualist in a seance as a travelling magician. Um, there was also uh, one instance I found quite uh, amusing in uh, Bendigo where they started bringing in spiritualists to perform um, seances in the Bendigo Hospital. In this particular instance, uh, um, they were sitting around the table in the dark and a ghost um, arose behind this woman, um, spoke purportedly that of her um, past on husband, and he came and put his hand on her shoulder and she turned around and bit him. And apparently the uh, ghost uh, erupted in a large uh, list of uh, swear words um, and quite disrupted the event. Um, but there's it's quite a few of these sorts of back and forth. There's a fellow by the name of Detective Black in Castlemaine who was playing a cat and mouse game with local spiritualists. Uh, in one case, encountering a woman who had a uh, bladder under her arm that she could use to produce ectoplasm, which turned out to be a uh, shaving cream mixed with um, phosphorus. Also worth noting um, the way in which uh, some of these sorts of discussions were um, represented by um, churches. And it was quite divided. We have this great quote here from the Ballarat Star about a modern satanic and false religion which has its preachers, male and female, its own press, mediums, wizards, disciples and dupes. Within 30 years, it has come into organised existence. Cradle in America, it has spread like wildfire through various portions of the civilised world, including Great Britain and the colonies, the number of its votaries are legion. That false religion is called spiritualism. It is carried out by a few sharpers and adventurers, the expense of their numerous and deluded, although in the majority of cases, innocents, uh, votaries, disciples, and dupes. Conversely, um, we also had some people arguing that the Christian church should adopt spiritualism and its practices and have mediums to assist ministers and priests with regards to um connecting to the faith of the dead at funerals and the like. So it, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, in one case, we had a uh, anti-spiritualist preacher at the uh, Bridge Street in Ballarat who was um, chased up um, the street by a group of spiritualist uh, devotees who were quite um, antagonistic to his presentation. So we have some yeah interesting um, dynamics here. There's uh, positive pro-spiritualist messages um, there's uh, warnings about the return of necromancy, superstition, and Satanism. Um, there's also a sceptical approach, which saw this as uh, people who had been um, uh, duped and that they need to embrace science and critical thinking and so on. That being said, spiritualists themselves presented their work as scientific, that they could actually provide evidence of the existence of the afterlife. And these debates sort of raged through the papers. Now, the final thing I'm going to bring in is um, yeah, not too bad for time, is the phenomenon of ghost hoaxing. Now, I know the picture on the right here is uh, from the British Illustrated Police News, but it's a nice depiction, I thought, of uh, these ghost hoaxes. 
Um, and this relates to um, phenomenon referred to in these Australian papers as acting the ghost or playing the ghost, where people are going out at night dressed in ghost costumes, usually involving um, phosphorus and glow-in-the-dark paint, uh, coated outfits, glowing white sheets, um, a lot feature hideous paper mache masks. Um, impersonating ghosts, particularly on sites where previous um, traumatic events had occurred, such as the one I mentioned earlier with the Harton Hills ghost. Um, I was actually fortunate enough not too long ago to find this folk song, The East Melbourne Ghost, about a, um, a fellow dressing up in a ghost costume and harassing young women in eastern uh, Melbourne. Um, I'll just move this around here. But, you know, talking about this, you know, he's a nuisance, he's a nuisance, Fodal Ridley, Ido, and so on. Uh, talking about this problem of ghost hoaxing. Um, so we have hundreds of these articles. Um, I've written a few articles on it, including in the journal Folklore. Um, my method for this, looking at this story, and it came about after reading a book, uh, Spirits of an Industrial Age, and reading some of Mike Dash's work, which led me to ponder, was this happening in Australia? So using some of those terms, like playing the ghost revealed thousands of uh, newspaper articles about the phenomenon, um, and what I did is I cross-referenced that with the Petty Crime Registry at the Public Records Office. So I could get times, dates, locations, uh, looking at the Petty Crimes regist Registry could bring up the, um, uh, the way in which it's uh, classified in the Petty Courts. And that also led me to the 937 record, which is um, reports by police officers on the beat where they actually talk about these experiences. Um, and these characters actually seem to um, build quite a reputation and enjoy the notoriety. Um, many of them actually took on personas. The early ones are referred to as spring Hill Jack, particularly in Bendigo, and some of the stories get quite outlandish. There was one fellow who became quite anxious that Bendigo was being haunted by a vampire and was wanting to patrol the cemetery at night to prevent this vampire rising from the grave and harassing women around uh, Lake Verona. Um, one character called himself the Wizard Bombardier with his white robes and a sugar loaf hat. Um, and yet one fellow had a uh, sort of a mock-up costume of knight's armour with prepare to meet thy doom written across his chest. And they go out at night and harass people. Sometimes with more nefarious ends too that I'll talk about shortly. Uh, here's go. This fellow with a white smock and coffin lid, for instance, um, actually stabbed a... Uh, <clears throat> a minor who intervened. He was down on Eureka Street in Ballarat and he was assaulting a, a young woman. Um, he had an outfit, um, as it says here, face smeared with phosphorus with a coffin lid on his back. Um, apparently he also had clawed hands and uh, he um, was grabbing this woman and a minor intervened and he actually stabbed this minor who was uh, quite seriously injured. I have a fellow in a similar costume at the Ballarat Cemetery who assaulted a woman walking home uh, one night from Craig's Hotel and she slashed him across the face with a knife um, in the hopes that it would lead to his identification. In Ballarat, one character, Herbert Patrick McLennan, um, called himself the Ballarat Ghost and his outfit consisted of a hideous paper mache mask, a white slouch hat, a white frock coat, a... Uh, um, long johns that had been soaked in phosphorus paint and uh, Indian uh, knee-high rubber boots. They actually arrested this fellow um, through the use of police officers uh, disguised as ladies of the night around the Ballarat uh, train station. And uh, when he went to accost them, apparently he'd also um, attacked them with a cat and nine tails and um, exposed himself to these people. Um, he was arrested and then they searched his home and found additional paraphernalia for costuming and so on, and he was uh, sentenced to a year's jail. So I had some experiments about what this sort of stuff may look like, and I uh, had a bit of a go with uh, glow-in-the-dark paints and so on to sort of get the effect. I felt this looking a lot like BBC fantasy shows uh, from when I was a child, actually. Um, but, you know, I thought it was an interesting thing to get an idea of what this would have looked like on a uh, pre-gaslit uh, street. Um, one on the left, for instance, I went to the thrift shore and bought an old uh, nightdress and soaked it in phosphorescent paint. Um, that's the paint water. Um, you can see there it actually produces quite a glow. Um, in That's actually just, yeah, my 
laundry. Um, and on the right, I painted up a paper mache mask, um, copying one that there was a picture of in the paper to get a sense of what it might have looked like at the time. So in response to the ghost nuisance, we start to see um, people out, you know, being vigilantes, hunting these guys. Uh, gangs of young men. On the left, you have the case of Charles Horman, um, who was patrolling the Ballarat Cemetery looking for ghosts with a shotgun. And he advocated the line, he said, that if it was a real ghost, there was no harm done, and if it was a fake ghost, it served him right for uh, dressing as a ghost and being a nuisance. Um, and there's quite a lot of these sort of stories. One was a ghost that was a school teacher. Um, he jumped out and scared people, and then he got captured by a gang of youths who beat him up. Um, and apparently gave him a flogging. And he yeah, turned out to be a local school teacher. It's interesting, in the UK context, there was a lot of folklore about these people being upper-class dilettantes enacting their um, uh, hobby against hard, you know, working-class people. In Australia, this was actually turned against the Irish, saying it was larrikin um, working-class people trying to enact revenge against upper-class educated folk to see if they could get them to believe in ghosts. However, the people who were actually arrested by police were invariably middle-class sorts. Uh, Herbert Patrick McLennan was an elocutionist. There were school teachers. There were store clerks. Um, I actually don't recall finding any working class people at all, except for the case of a lady who was unemployed but was dressing as a ghost and stealing people's chickens in uh, Snake Valley. So in terms of dealing with the ghost nuisance on several occasions in Ballarat and Bendigo particularly, if you look here, uh, they started issuing rewards. Um, in this case, a reward of five pounds offered for the capture of the person acting the ghost in the city carried. And this had a rather disastrous effect because the advent of money led to a lot of people out at night hoping to catch a ghost to achieve income, some of which seemed to be humorous. There was a fellow dressed in ladies' clothing in Bendigo at spots where ghosts had been seen carrying a large fire poker to assault people. Um, but this also led to innocent people occasionally getting assaulted because they were wearing a, you know, a smock from working in bricklaying or covered in coal dust or whatever. Um, and in this particular incident in Bain Street in Bendigo, which was quite disastrous, where a gang of youths are in the vicinity of uh, Bain Street looking for the Bain Street ghost, and they were waiting with shotguns. Um, they'd had an incident of a woman um, claiming to have been assaulted by the ghost. They sat there and wait, and when they opened fire on the ghost, the ghost returned fire with a revolver, leading to a yeah, battle, gun battle with a ghost, if you like. Um, but in one of these incidents, um, a woman who was a passerby was hit by a stray piece of shrapnel and seriously injured, which led to a, uh, a crackdown um, on trying to prevent this kind of vigilantism um, in the pursuit of ghosts. But, yeah, we have some nice depictions here, a fellow with his revolver pointing at a, a ghost here on the right. Um so, you know, again, quite um, disastrous. I'm reminded, actually, when I was reading, uh, writing the book on big cat folklore um, in Australia, where in uh, People magazine in 1980 offered a $30,000 reward for anyone who shot a uh, escaped big cat in the Victorian countryside. And I have letters from police writing a letter, uh, writing um, comments to the Minister for the Environment at the time to put a stop to this because they encountered people discharging firearms from a moving vehicle on the Calder Freeway at what they thought was a big cat, which is really quite scary when you think of, um, you know, where these uh, um, firearm um, shells are going to end up. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude, and I, as I always love to conclude with talk on ghosts, you know, the Traumas of our past demand acknowledgement, and if we don't engage with them, they continue to erupt irrationally in the form of ghost stories that force us to confront a difficult past. And with that, I will um, hand over to our hosts and answer any questions people have. Goodness me, that was fantastic. So I think the first thing I need to do is just ask everybody to congratulate David on such a fantastic talk in whichever way they see fit, whether to turn our mics off, applaud um, in such a fashion physically, mm -hmm. put the wee hand sign going. I'm going to just like 
<laughs> do the applause there because that was absolutely fantastic um so many sort of topics covered there um just shows the importance and the need for folklore to tie a lot of these uh beliefs and understandings together i did not think we'd get to gun battles with a ghost tonight but we sure did um and i think just as you said i finished your talk there david that sense of reacting rationally to uh to events of the past i think we should try and react rationally uh, in order to your talk and sort of um, pick through the questions that have come through on the chat. Um, I'll look through the ones that we've got here and uh, offer up the space to folks to come on camera. Um, or indeed, if you've something has come to mind since uh, David's talk is, um, has, has finished, just stick your hand up and I'll do my best to notice that and let you say your piece. So I think if we sort of start um, looking through the chat, I think the first question that came in um, was from yourself, Caroline. So do you want to have a wee question about that, about ghosts ever telling people where to dig for gold? I think you did two almost geological questions mm -hmm. together at the start there. That, that was absolutely amazing. Thanks ever so much, David. Um, I just had a couple of questions about the mining traditions and mm -hmm. whether people were using ghosts as a means of staking a claim and keeping other people off it, or whether ghosts told people where to go digging? Um, this is sort of interesting. I didn't talk about it tonight, but I did a talk for Mark Norman for his folklore podcast a few months back. Um, there's a lot of superstitions about mining in Australia, and a lot of them seem to parallel really closely the same superstitions in Appalachia, but also in uh, Cornwall particularly and in Wales. Um, there's stories about um, spirits giving you warning that a mine is going to collapse or the air is bad. I found a story about um, that lanterns would have flames that would point towards a fellow who's been marked by the spirits uh, that he might die as a warning not to go down or spirits telling people warnings or hearing strange sounds like bird calls in the mine that's a sign that the mine's going to collapse. Um Spirits giving warnings through the use of dowsing and those particular, I'm trying to remember, it was like an oak and a holly branch that you needed to use, I think it was, I might be wrong, um, that would react and that would tell you that there's a spot to dig for gold. Um, so there's quite a bit of that. I also found um, a story of people seeing a red dog near a mine and that was a warning that the mine was dangerous. Um, another one that was... Uh, seeing a fellow in what looked like oil skin and um, fur near a mine as a warning that it was dangerous. There's some too that relate to um, Indigenous folklore. I'm always very cautious about this because I don't want to talk on behalf of Indigenous folklore beliefs, but if I just talk about what the newspapers said, noting that it's colonists um, uh, writing about another culture they don't understand, one story had a... A hairy man, they called it, who was seen near um, workings near Mount Cole and that the Indigenous people refused to work uh, while this hairy man was in the area and they actually mounted up posses to try and find him but didn't. Uh, and it was unclear whether they were meaning a, um, a hairy man um, is in wearing the traditional fur cloaks or hairy is in like a wild man character because, again, we got cross-cultural translation they did refer, though, to the belief amongst the Indigenous people that this man was wearing emu feather boots that meant he couldn't be tracked. Um, and again, you know, don't they wouldn't work because they'd seen this figure on premises. So, you know, there's sort of a lot to unpack there, so, but it, not, not so much here's a ghost look for gold, but certainly you get stories of spirits in the mines, particularly um, bringing warning of uh, foretelling doom. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks for that. Uh, I think the next one I've got here uh, early on in the chat is from um, Sophia. And sort of, I think your question, Sophia, is like leaping a bit forward in time, but I think it's really worth um, mm -hmm. getting David's opinion upon it. So on you go. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And yes, uh, well, I've got two questions. One of them is is right outside your the period you're talking about but mm. it's it's not a I don't think it's outside your geographical range yeah. um I my my father was interned in Hay internment camp in New yeah. South Wales during the Second yeah. World War um a, a story I've always been fascinated by um and I wondered if there it, it, if the sites of 
well, if the sites of the mm. camps are, are kept up as visitor sites and also if there are any haunting stories connected with them. They do tours of some of the sites um, from uh, at least the ones in Victoria. They The Shepherd and Historical Society do tours of them. They're on private land. Um, the one where they kept the German POWs, it's a it's on private land and the farmer sometimes gets really angry if he sees people, but it's just forested bushland. It's all in ruins. Um, and there's actually a monument there um, to Germans lost in the Second World War. Um, that's got cell blocks and so on, which is sort of just crumbling away. Um, but it is reputed that the um, uh, site is haunted by internees and so on. There's a bit of folklore that some people were shot by firing squad there for escaping. Um, there's certainly bullet holes in the walls that in a particular place at the end of a cell block that might be the source of that. I don't know how true that is or not. Um, a lot of interesting um, German graffiti on the walls. Um, in one case, a fellow uh, made a uh, very anatomically accurate, I guess I'll call it, uh, carving of a naked woman that stretched across the wall um, in his cell. So, you know, those sites are there and the, the local yarns are. I haven't found paper, newspaper stories of it, but there's certainly local yarns that you, see, you hear children playing or you hear sounds from the camp on the site. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're certainly around. Um, and it's kind of interesting where um, another one of these sites, again, crumbling in ruins in a forest, um, there's Japanese graves, but there's usually fresh flowers laid on the graves. So someone's visiting them and um, caring for them. So, yeah, there's elements of that in from that Second World War period of internment. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you for that. Uh, mm. uh, Ross, shall I ask my second question, which, uh, or shall I yeah. wait until... Uh, no. Uh, my other my other question was about the stories you have actually told, which there seem mm. to be quite a common theme through many of them of mm. people pretending to be ghosts or people mistaking things for ghosts that turned out yes. not to be. And I wondered if that was uh, in any way a reflection of what what we perhaps mistakenly think of as an Australian national characteristic of cynicism or sense of humour mm. or realism, whatever you like to call it. Do you think that's so or is it just... That, that's certainly part of it. And there's certainly an attempt, though, to, to quash local ethnic folkloric customs, particularly of the Irish. There's a lot of anxiety about the Irish being a threat yeah, that's in, right. in Australia. Mm. And so I find it interesting at a time when British tourists are going off to watch Keening Circles in Ireland as a hobby, um, in Australia they're being suppressed by police. Um, the other side too, um, I have a theory and I'm going to, it's not fully fleshed out, but I want to work on this theory. When I was working in the UK doing stuff on the witch trials and the black dog, I kept finding these myths that might date to the 1970s and things like that, but very quickly would have become, oh, it's always been like that or it's ancient or you'd link it back to pre-industrial heritage. Mm. Um, quite a few of them started off in books like uh, Hipsley Cox's Haunted Britain or... Bungie, the Three Tons Hotel, was meant to be haunted by a confederate of Dick Turpin, which dated back to an episode of That's Incredible where they brought in a medium in the 70s. But very quickly it's like, oh, no, it's always been like that for centuries, but you'd actually trace it back and go, this might be 30 years old or Victorian, but it's become ancient very quickly. And I saw it that my loose theory is, and please bear with me, this is a loose theory, that in Britain, because national identity is linked to the pre-industrial past, these stories are a way of connecting yourself to location, landscape and heritage, particularly done in opposition to the social disruption of the Industrial Revolution and the enclosure movement and so on. You know, hence folklore itself becomes a discipline in response to those issues to preserve cultural identity. In Australia, there's an issue where if you go back to the pre-industrial heritage, you have to confront the fact that Indigenous people were living here first and it's their heritage and their folklore and their history. And what I've found in Australia is that people would very quickly come to sort of a contemporary pseudo-scientific or plausible explanation in the recent past as a way of legitimating belief, even when stories are much older. 
So the story of big cats in the bush in Australia, the earliest story I found was from really early exploration and settlement in 1836. Um, yet people would be today saying, oh, it's American servicemen who released them after the war in the Second World War, or it was a circus escape 10 years ago, that kind of thing. Um, so you have much older myths that are given these short rational explanations because they don't want to confront the issue of heritage. That's sort of my interpretation of it, but it's not something I've fully fleshed out, but I, I think I wouldn't mind doing a book or something on this because that link to ghosts and national identity, I think, is very pertinent. So some cases I think you have a ghost story and they want to dismiss it, so we'll throw a rational-sounding explanation to um, get rid of it quickly. With the story of Robert Downey at the Hart and Hills ghost, I mean, they have a culprit and say he was playing the ghost, yet... Um, you know, they found a they found an itinerant woodcutter and they beat him up until he confessed. I'm not sure how legit that is as an explanation for the ghost people are saying. <laughs> that's, that's... Uh, your your theory, your theory is fascinating. I, I, I do write the book. I want to read it, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you've got a queue of people wanting to read that book now, David. Um, I, I think you're going to have to have to write it. I think the next one that we've got is a nice sort of discussion that we had there about ideas of bundling that sort of stem from one of the slides that you had there. But I think the mm -hmm. next question that we've got is um, is Gemma. Gemma, you, you okay to come on camera and ask your question? There she yes, is. I'm Evening, here. Gemma. Hi. Here. Evening. Hi. Um. Thank you, David. That was amazing. And I do I do love a good ghost story. Uh, my question was, I should probably explain, I was raised on true crime because my grandparents thought mm. that was how you made sure your child behaved. And um, I remember learning about the, the Port Arthur massacre in Australia. Mm. And when you mentioned mm. it as a haunted site, I just wondered if, you know, the connections you're talking about with traumatic histories and mm. ghosts coming out of that, if you know, there had been a connection or anything on site pertaining to, you know, that, you know, traumatic event mm. that happened there, or is it maybe too recent? They did have a tour about the Port Arthur massacre and ghost stories about it, and there was such mm -hmm. national outrage that they shut them down very, very quickly. Yeah, I know it was a huge, a huge sort of um, influence on, mm. you know, there was very rapid change in gun legislation and things like that. Yeah. But I did, I mm. did just wonder, because I hadn't heard of anything yeah. ghostly or supernatural coming out of yeah. it, but yeah. I was curious. Well, there were, there are yarns and there are stories about it. And when they've, I mean, you've got the interesting thing with ghost stories where they start to proliferate and popularise ghost stories and entrench them. Yeah, they yeah. did attempt to have a Port Arthur themed true crime slash ghost story tour of Port Arthur, and it was all over the national papers, and that tour was shut down within a week. I see. Okay, because I um assume most of the ghost stories extant about Port Arthur would be about its time as a penal colony. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. M most are about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Gemma. I think I, I'd, I'd set a one that I was going to just throw in on that point, David, just to sort of build from that. I was I was just wondering about you know, the sites of ghost tours and senses of sort of dark mm. tourism. And I just thought that, you know, one of the sort of um, most famous shows on TV in Britain along these lines in recent years, where ghost hunting has been most haunted. And mm. I just wondered, was there equivalence of that, you know, of TV shows doing this in Australia? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, they've done it several times at the Ararat Mental Hospital. They've uh, actually had uh, John Edwards, the psychic, uh, get in touch with me about doing it on the Ballarat Jail, which is a university campus. And the university is very happy for me to do local history tours for the Heritage Festival, which is quite dark because the Ballarat Jail has a dark history. Um, the university I work for quite balked at the thought of having John Edwards come and do an investigation thing on site. Um, it's the wrong sort of attention to bring the uni. Um, they're quite common. Um, I should add, um, an Indonesian horror film was filmed at Aradel, um, Tuja Badari, and the theme is the six Indonesian tourists who go to Melbourne. They're lured to Ararat by a suave young gentleman. And they're actually brought there as sacrifices for the ghost of a Chinese woman who died in the asylum, who's um, they're trying to resurrect, uh, a cult's trying to resurrect. Um, so 
you know, it's that international attention. And of course, every time you do these, every time you do the shows, you increase attention, more people come. And it's worth noting um, uh, my my colleague uh, who uh, he writes he writes bits of the book uh, Aradale Making of a Haunted Asylum um, brings in something like three hundred thousand dollars a year through um, all the different tours and investigation tours and so on and so on. Recently, we've I've been working with him to develop uh, ghost tours for the uh, Melbourne Quarantine Station, which has a similar difficult history, particularly the ships that came across in the 1850s where they built in extra decks into the ship to fit more people. So you had 900 people crammed onto a, uh, a ship for six months with major disease outbreaks. So the Ticonderoga had a 170 people die from of typhus on board and they were buried in a mass grave at the um, centre of the station. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the next one we've got here, um, going down to the chat, is one from Angela, and Angela's on a train, so unfortunately can't come on camera mm -hmm. to ask it, so I'll pass it on. Uh, she's thanking you for a wonderful talk, and her question is, have you come across any ghost-related material culture, such as haunted objects or cursed objects? If so, would you please give me your thoughts on that? Um... There are a few. The Ballarat Gallows is reputed to be haunted, which has an interesting history that when the Ballarat Jail was closed, parts were dismantled. The gallows ended up going to, uh, through a few different hands, ended up in the old curiosity shop, was bought by the Wadi Yalek Historical Society, who restored them and put them behind the courthouse in um, Smithsdale. Um, so, you know, you know, you touch it, you feel cold, all those sorts of stories. Um so there's a bit of that kind of thing. Um, I've come across uh, stories of haunted dolls, haunted poppets. Um, so, you know, they're certainly about haunted pictures, things like that. Um, yeah, they're around, they occur, yeah. Great. Cheers, David. Um, and the next one we've got on the chat is a question from Abirup. Um, hopefully I've pronounced your name uh, correctly. Abirup, are you okay to come on camera to ask it? I think we're back thinking about the ethics of the research as well. Mm. There we go. Oh, you're just still on mute, Abarak. Just, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry. There you go. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yep. sorry. Yeah, wonderful talk. Uh, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Because uh, I'm also looking forward, I'm, I'm actually working towards something similar. So what I wanted to ask is, uh, you talked about so like the conversation around ghost narratives being trauma being a part of uh, traumatic experiences you also shared about the asylum which usually is mm. something people go to even hospitals that people go to yeah. in terms of getting ghost narratives one thing uh, that i have encountered here in so i'm i'm from northeast and i'm working in northeast india right now so mm. uh, there is a wonderful, wonderful uh, narrative here of an old legend that continues even today. But what I encounter a lot is people not willing to, you know, open up about those mm. experiences and those narratives. So what I wanted to know is one, uh, the notion of empathy, if that factors in the tellability and you know the continued existence mm. of these ghost narratives. And the second, if while collecting these narratives, because you uh, like you showed a lot uh, of newspaper and articles and stories mm. that were written down before, right? So if uh, while collection, you met someone who was unwilling to share the story, because mm. a lot of time uh, what I have encountered is people associating the idea of grandeur to these stories. Because I've actually mm. heard people tell me, you know, my, my story is not that not that grand it's it, it mm. doesn't doesn't fit in your idea of a ghost story mm. so i just wanted to ask about this have if you have encountered well, such situations yeah for, for a lot of my research because i'm looking at uh 19th and early 20th century i can just do so archivally i can read the newspaper articles and i do do a lot of cross-reference that to asylum records or police records and develop my story concurrently um I, in terms of ethics, the way I like to see a lot of this is we have traumatic stories. These people should have their stories told. The, when, I, when I talk about the one, for instance, of the woman who's pregnant out of wedlock and then is murdered or commits suicide, 
I sit there and think, well, this is a fundamental injustice that women have always had to face, a fundamental vulnerability. This should be told. You know, the story that the the you know, in a sense, metaphorically, the ghosts are saying, you know, our story needs to be told to the present. That we shouldn't forget these people who have been lost to the past. Um, so I usually configure it in those terms. When I've worked with uh, Indigenous Australians, I usually frame it as what story would you like to tell or what um, injustice would you like to have out? Now, of course, working for university, um, we have an ethics process that we need to go to when we interview people if we're talking about um, human research. Um one of the things is you cannot use any sort of coercion. You need to work out what people want to say and let them speak and bring it forward in their own terms. And to do that, you have to build trust with your community. That being said, for instance, I've got an article on the Heart and Hills ghost that's there with a lot of detail. I would love to publish it one day, but I can't because half of that story are taboo topics for the Gunjimara people and they don't want to um they don't want to bring that out there because it's it's taboo and personal and private to their culture. And I just have to respect that and know I'm never going to publish it. So um, recently, though, working with uh, the Wadarung community on the Yarrawee and the way in which this river flowing through Ballarat was destroyed in the gold rush and the impact it had, what I actually did is I approached the community and I spoke at their Nialalal um, meeting of elders and said what I wanted to do. And I phrased it as, you know, what story would you like to tell? And what do you feel is important to get out to the public? And I then put it on their hands to present it to me. And then I found material to help support um, the stories that they wanted to get out. And then I took it back to them and worked with them back and forth. And then we've um, produced this interactive website on the history of the ROE that includes water run content. Um, but generally, you know, you've got to build, connect, build connection with the community. You have to build trust. You need to make sure that the people also feel fairly represented in how the materials put across and, you know, respect the ethics process because um, it can be deeply traumatic or hurtful if people's stories are misrepresented or if they feel ridiculed and so on. But, and chances are if they're not willing to talk, it's because they feel scared that they'll be ridiculed or they will be um, humiliated or the story's personal to them that they are unsure. So, again, you know, build trust and network your community is what I'd suggest. Oh, there we go. That's that's great. Thanks so much. They're a brilliant question and uh, you know, really important and mm. um, um, yeah, necessary answer that you've given us there, David. I mean, there's a few questions I've still got on the bit of paper here that I was scrolling down during the talk, but I think if there's nothing else that's coming through, um, anybody else wants to raise their hand? Uh, Caroline's also put a few thoughts to sort of back up your um, your ideas just there from a few other um, writers on folklore. I think really, I think the, where you've brought us to in the discussion there, you know, you've given us such a sort of warm and vivid and important talk this evening full of such a, such great examples from the past. I think if we sort of finish finish the point that you've Finish the evening with the points that you've made just there on, uh, on ideas about whose stories we are telling and who gets to tell them from the past mm. and from the present. I think that's something very, very important for anybody with an interest in folklore to remember and consider the 21st century as well. So mm. I think on that note, I think we should sort of thank David for his thought-provoking and brilliant paper tonight. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. There we go. Fantastic. Well, I think I'll hand over hand over to Caroline again for some closing announcements, if you've got any there. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, well, I'm, it's partly to say thank you to David first and to Ross for chairing, but also to wish everybody a very, very happy festive season. And uh, I hope you uh, all get your Christmas trees up in the next weekend or so. And... We will be returning to the on online talks on the 12th of January with Victoria Newton, who will be talking about reproductive body law, um, the role of vernacular knowledge in contraceptive choices. And the, Victoria is very expert on this and she's part of the Open University's body law project, or she runs it. So that, that'll be January and... Uh, 
There are many more talks that I'm about to put up onto Eventbrite and the, the website. And also, in the next day or two, we'll have the um, call for papers announced for our Digital Folklore Conference, which is going to take place at King's College London on the 28th to the 30th of June 2024. So don't forget, if you want a copy of the chat file, email us. And um, after that, thank you and goodbye.